Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and we're going to be talking today with Brett Larkin about the fusion of yoga, journaling, meditation, and the chakras. Brett is the founder of Uplifted Yoga, an online yoga and meditation community, empowering students to personalize their practice and ignite their best life on and off the mat. She has instructed at top yoga studios and at companies like Google and Pinterest and leads the world's most interactive online yoga teacher training program. She has a social media following of 150,000 people and her content on YouTube is streamed for 2 million minutes each month. So this lady is everywhere and you can learn more at brettlarkin.com. Brett, thanks so much for joining me today on A Healthy Curiosity. I'm so happy to be here and connect with you. So thanks for having me. Well, it was a blast doing your show a little while ago and that um, it was it was really fun talking to you. And I'd love to hear more about how you unite yoga, journaling, and meditation. First of all, how did you come up with that particular combination and why should people care? And I'm excited to dive into the chakras too, but let's start mm-hmm. with that fusion yeah. because it's it's a lot. Yoga has always been a precursor to meditation, right? Mm -hmm. I think so many people, especially now in America, like yoga is seen as this fitness thing. And if we really dive into the work of Patanjali and the yoga sutras, it's so clear that the physical asana practice is just one limb, right? Of the eight limbs of yoga. And it's really designed to get the body quiet enough to meditate. Uh, get your yayas out so that you can sit your ass down so and that you can get clear. Sit yeah. Still, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's all about sitting still. So, from very early in my teaching and my interest in yoga, I always wanted to keep meditation at the forefront because a lot of times it just gets forgotten or it's not included in perhaps a lot of the studio fitness classes you go to at all, which is fine. But if we look at yoga in a larger context, which is what I like to do when I love Tantra and Samkhya philosophy, right? We are doing yoga to step into our most authentic self, to live our best life, not just on the mat, but off the mat. And how to do that, (laughs) there's so many different lenses that you can look at how to do that. But the lens that I focus on in my trainings and my teaching is this idea of reuniting with Brahma, right? Universal intelligence from which we came. So in the yogic philosophy, we as individuals are, can be described as Atman, right? We're like little droplets, but we're made up of the same stuff as universal intelligence, Brahma, which can be analogous to the ocean, right? So when we meditate, it's like our chance <laughs> to reconnect with universal intelligence and to bring some of that inspiration down into our daily living through Shushumna Nadi, which is the central channel, uh, which the chakras live on, which we'll talk about later that runs up and down the spine. So fusing yoga and meditation is just obvious. Like that's right, that's, what, that's a no brainer. That's, that's the highest no potential, brainer. right? And, yes. and really, like yoga can be a form of meditation. I would think there, there's the physical benefits that you can get from practicing asana, and of course, asana is only one of the many branches. And the way that most people are getting their yoga doesn't necessarily allow us to to develop its full potential or to utilize it to its full potential of that self realization, right? Of like recognizing that we are this the drops in the ocean of consciousness. Exactly. And I love the physical benefits. Love. I mean, I, I want to look good in a tank top and, 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 you know, do chaturanga and Absolutely. strengthen my body, but I'm very type A. So I want to do more and I want to do more at the mm-hmm. same time. So if we can <laughs> fuse meditation, I think ideally at the end of the yoga asana practice, which is the way I like to do it, But what I found, Brody, like so many students were still struggling. Even though they did the physical asana practice first, they were still having a hard time getting quiet in their meditation seat or clearing their mind. They still had the crazy train of thoughts going on 24-7 and they felt like they were bad meditators. Now, this is where journaling I found was sort of like this secret third piece that we can bring in. 
because we live in a time and a society where we're in, we're in our logical mind so much, it dominates. We really can do a brain dump and it can be really, really helpful. And there's so many different ways that you can journal. I think people have this impression of journaling as dear diary today, you know, such and such happened. And I always love to clarify that, that that's not the kind of journaling I'm talking about here. In fact, I outline a couple different ways you can journal. So one of them, and, and this is all to, again, help clear your mind, uh, prep you for meditation. And what students and people in my community have told me is that when they do this kind of journaling pre-meditation, they have incredible insights and they're able to meditate so much easier or feel that connection to something greater than ourselves in in such a faster, more direct route. Oh, I love that you just brought up a few things, a few key points there. A, the mind is going to think, right? Like that, that a lot of people feel like they're failures at meditation if their minds never get quiet. And that's kind of unrealistic in my opinion. Like just like you can't stop breathing for all that long. You can't stop your heart from beating. You can't really stop your mind from generating thoughts. But if you do dump them out of your brain, it's really a lot easier to separate yourself from their habituated streams or like to, to step away from them and, and get enough space from the content of them to access something else. Is that your experience? Yes, definitely. And I think people, yes, they have very unrealistic expectations, right? Like if my mind is not empty, I'm failing at meditation. And what I like to remind them of is like, no, no, no. Meditation is just a practice of stilling the mind. And some days it goes well, and some days it's a big struggle, even for master meditators. So there's so many techniques we can use, and I'm sure people have heard these before on your show, but whether it's naming your thoughts, right, or just bringing your attention back to the breath, um, these, are, these are all really helpful things. But I think it's really important, and if there's one takeaway people can leave the show with, is to just know that you are not failing at meditation or failing in, in general if you end up thinking the majority of your meditation practice. There's a key aspect here, too, that we miss that I want to bring in, which is that between the asana and the meditation, something else has to happen. And that is pranayama, a breathing technique. The breathing technique can also really help take you out of that logical mind and deeper connect you with the breath. So that's another pitfall I see people make. Either they just sit to meditate, they don't do asana. And you know, asana could just be a little stretch beforehand. You know, I know Mm -hmm. we don't all have tons of time, but they miss doing that opening pranayama technique. And if you miss that, oh, it's just going to be so much harder to still the mind and quiet your thoughts. If we look at how Patanjali wrote and designed the practice of yoga, he was very explicit that pranayama had to happen before meditation. And if you're listening and you don't know what pranayama means or is, it just means a breathing technique that, that's not just inhaling and exhaling slowly like we do in meditation, something more specific. So a great example would be alternate nostril breathing, Nadi Shodana, which is a great practice, or breath of fire, Kabbalah Bhati, another great practice. Something very specific like that is going to also help anchor the mind, anchor the thoughts. And then journaling kind of takes it to the next level, I think. <laughs> and you'd want to do the journaling how I do it is that we do the yoga asana. Listeners who've been to a yoga class, you know that typical yoga classes tend to start with standing poses, right? There's, there's a warm up, there's a heat, heating period, there's usually a cool down. So in those cool down periods, you're often holding poses for a longer period of time. Say, for example, a forward fold or a pigeon hip stretch. We're still, we're maybe there for two or three minutes. That's a great opportunity where you can journal on your mat because you're still. And by using yoga blocks and other things that I show in my videos, you can actually get it so it's pretty comfortable. So you can write and stretch at the same time. Now, in an ideal world, right, we're doing like a 90 minute yoga practice, a 30 minute journaling, you know, 15 minutes of pranayama, and then 20 minutes of meditation, right? That would be awesome. But I don't know anyone who has that kind of time. So with this sort of combo practice and the the classes that I do that are like this are 30 minutes. We do 
you know, some asana, we build heat in the body. We do these cool down poses and journal at the same time, right? Just because we're still, and it's like, kind of, why not kill two birds with one stone? And then we do a little bit of pranayama and a meditation. So that is really packing a lot into a short amount of time. And that, that seems like it would be really useful if people wanted to that like maybe they're meditators who want to who want to be able to deepen and get get their thoughts out of the way faster like it's it seems very efficient it's definitely efficient and i designed it for folks who are moms who are working who are looking for something to do usually in the morning every mm-hmm. day right so i'm not saying this is the be all end all solution it's like no like when you can take a longer practice or do some of these things individually for long periods of time do there's massive value to that but what i found in my community that people were really craving was something that they could just do <laughs> every morning consistently that fit into their schedule and in my experience that 30 minute time period works well for a lot of people in in my community. And I find it works well for myself as well, because then it's like, if you can fit more in later in the day, maybe you can slip in some journaling at lunch, or you can fit in a nice evening, longer practice. Awesome. But no matter what, you got those 30 minutes of the most important things in right in the morning. And then we we haven't even talked yet about how the classes are also designed to shift your energy depending mm -hmm. on how you feel on a certain day. And that's getting into the chakras, but I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves. This episode of A Healthy Curiosity is brought to you by my Basics of Chinese Medicine course. You probably know your Myers-Briggs type and your astrological sign, but do you know your Chinese element? Knowing your element can help you recognize your superpowers, your innate gifts, and how to maximize them. It can also help you avoid becoming a caricature of yourself. But better yet, when you understand your constitution, you can start to get to know which acupoints, meridians, foods, tastes, and activities are going to be medicine for you. And that, my friend, opens up a whole new world of self-care. Basics of Chinese Medicine is an eight-week deep dive into understanding your inner ecosystem. Registration is now open and we start October 18th. You'll learn how to confidently locate and use some of the most powerful acupoints and some essential oils that pair well with them, how to eat with the seasons, how to tell what a food or an herb does by how it tastes, as well as each internal organ's mystical powers, its emotional and psychological functions. To register, visit BrodyWelch.com, that's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H, and grab your spot. I couldn't agree more that if you can start your day from a place of centeredness, a place of presence, and a place of being connected to yourself, which includes being connected to your body and your breath body, like we're not just our physical bodies, we, you know, we're our, this energy body as well. So if you're doing yoga and you're journaling and you're meditating before your day starts, you're going to have a much better day. It seems like that just that I know for me, like those are some of the absolutely most vital components to me feeling like I can aim at and hit my target of whatever it is that I'm trying to do that day. Totally. And I feel like I touched on the the different ways you can journal, but just to give your listeners some concrete examples of, of what that's like, is yeah. it's not the Dear Diary. There's a couple techniques that I outline of the different ways you can do uplifted journaling. <laughs> But Mm -hmm. one of them is, as an example, a brain dump. So you just write everything that's on your mind, sort of stream of consciousness style. And it's sort of just like word vomit. Like you just get it out on the page. Like, uh, and it might start with like, my hip feels really tight. Oh, what am I going to make for dinner tonight? And you know, you just start dumping and writing this stuff on the page. It's very powerful because it shows you then that your thoughts aren't you right? Like once you get it down on the page, you can sort of look at your, your, your brain or word vomit, right? Mm -hmm. And it gives you this really nice perspective. Another technique I love is uh, what I call sort of like the Jekyll and Hyde technique, which is where you write a bunch of questions, things that you're craving answers to wisdom you're seeking. So it could be, you know, how should I move forward in this relationship? what should I do about my boss? Things like that. And then actually I guide you through a meditation. And after the meditation, we come back to the journal and you channel your highest self and answer the questions from your most authentic, open 
sort of version of yourself. And it's amazing sometimes the wisdom that comes through. And it's awesome because it's like free therapy. (laughs) Exactly. Well, it sounds like, yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's like, that we, we, we know that we have this internal wisdom, but it's, it can be, it can be an amazing, it can be amazingly close, the answers, or even just abiding with the question, like asking a good question can be the secret to, I think, getting in touch with some really critical inner wisdom that, that could be a critical by, by that. I mean, vital, not, not destructive, <laughs> destructive criticism voice. Uh, but the, and the brain dump thing, it's like, I, I encourage people to do that. If they're having trouble falling asleep, like just get it out of your mind. So that the mind is like, okay, yeah, I don't have to hang on to that anymore. And that just, it's, it's just like sweeping off a cluttered counter or a cluttered desk so that there's clarity so that you can focus on what really matters. And it makes so much sense that it would be so much easier to meditate after you do this. And yeah. it's like, you don't have to do it for 30 minutes. It's just like nope. a five or 10 minute journaling and you can do it while you're stretching. Yeah, exactly. And if your brain is already quiet, then great. Right. And if all else fails, my big message to your listeners is like, if you, you know, you're like, you don't want to write the brain dump. You just, you just can't, and you don't want to do some of the cool Q and a stuff. Again, I outline a bunch of different techniques. Um, but one, one fail safe is to have a couple key affirmations that you're working with. And I like to design my affirmations around the chakras, which I know we're about to talk about uh and just write the affirmation over and over and over again. A lot of people, I think don't resonate with affirmations because it feels very cheesy to say them out loud. And I'm one of those people too. I don't love like walking around my house and shouting out my affirmations. It feels so corny. And I think the people who who resonate with that, that's awesome. Do it. But it never felt right for me. So it was a huge breakthrough when I realized that I could just write my affirmation, not just once, But I recommend writing each affirmation that you're working with three to six times. Because if we want to talk about mind-body connection, which I think gets thrown around in our industries a lot, if you write something six times in a row, like there's a bodily connection there to your brain where you're, you know, again, writing longhand in a journal. It's very hard. Say you have... Uh, you know, an affirmation like I attract abundance, which might be associated with third chakra. Um, It's really hard for them the rest of your day to kind of like have negative money thoughts when you literally wrote that down like six times in a row. Uh, So if you don't know like what to journal or write at all, that's a very easy place to start. I think there's some magic in that repetition Mm -hmm. and you can do that every day. Kind of like a mantra. Yes, exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. Like just so, so repeating something over and over again in your mind, it, it, it attunes you to that, to that frequency. The thing with affirmations, my resistance to them is that if it feels like lying to yourself, it's not going to work. And so crafting an affirmation that you can, that at least part of you is willing to believe is really important. Otherwise, it may actually do more harm than good is, uh, is the research that I've seen into that. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you mentioned that on on my show yeah. too. Because yeah, if you're taking it too far, I mean, there is something to fake it till you make it, but sure. you need to like believe it a little bit. Otherwise it's, it's, yeah, it's going to feel exactly. inauthentic. So, so let's, let's address the chakra system head on here. Cause I know chakras get made fun of a lot. They're kind of an easy target, right? Like that for, for when, when people are trying to diminish perhaps uh, the yoga tradition or, or energy medicine in general, uh, you know, the idea that people who speak in these sort of airy fairy energy center sort of things like, oh, well, those aren't real. Those are, you know, that it's easy to dismiss them. So I'd like for you to to walk us through why chakras, why we should care about them, why why we should pay attention to them and what they are. And, you know, in general, like sort of my understanding of, of the chakras is that they're energy centers and that I often liken an acupoint to a mini chakra. Like it's a place on the body where energy can be accessed that has a particular frequency or a particular characteristic and that it symbolizes that. I'd love to hear how you describe chakras and and what can help us understand that they're a real thing. So I completely agree with your definition. I think the first step is yes, they let's think of them as Chakra literally means wheel, right? So you can think of them as a a vortex or wheel of energy in the body. Now, the yoga tradition, just like I I think, uh, this is why I love talking to you, Chinese medicine tradition, right? There's there's actually thousands of chakras in the body, Mm -hmm. sub chakras. So 
people get very focused on, you know, the, the, the main ones and, and that's great, but I want to make sure listeners understand that the, the yoga system acknowledges that no, there's not just the seven chakras. There's thousands of these points throughout the, throughout the system, especially in key glandular areas of the body. But these seven, the, the, the main seven chakras that run from the base of the spine to the crown of the head are these key energy points. And I, and that al- analogy I really like to use, and I use this in my yoga teacher training with folks, is that with the chakras, we're talking about subtle energy, which the Chinese medicine uh, tradition has, and, and I think so many different traditions talk about and incorporate And that when we talk about subtle energy, just like if you asked someone to draw a map of California, right? (laughs) Some people might draw a map that included every city from San Diego to San Francisco, including small cities like Sacramento and, uh, you know, Orange County. Some people might draw a map that just had like San Francisco, LA, San Diego. Some people might draw the mountains, right? Or focus on the roads or focus on the roads and just the highways or focus on the roads and, you know, all the side streets, right? So I think we can kind of let go of chakras compared to acupressure points or, you know, this modality compared to that modality. The chakras are just one lens, like one sure. map that, that you can use to think and talk about subtle energy. Yeah, how we how we consider the landscape of the subtle body is going to vary depending on the scale, as you were pointing out. Like uh, people might put different things on their map. We could also look at the fact that in Chinese medicine, Sushum Nanadi, the central channel, that's going to correspond with the Du, the Ren, the Chong, uh, the conception vessel, governor vessel, um, and the penetrating vessel, which are part of the extraordinary vessel systems, and that on the central channel pathways there are points on on both the governor vessel and conception vessel on the front and the back of the body that could be considered like access points for the chakras and so it is certainly and and the that how the the yogic system and the chinese medicine system look at these different areas there's a lot of overlap and and what that tells me like when systems overlap and and sort of indicate very similar things there's something to that there's something worth considering there i agree i mean i had a friend over yesterday who was uh, China, you know, more into the Chinese system like you. And we were talking about, I hope I say it right, but upper, mid and lower Dantian. Yep. And I said, oh, well, it just sounds like the fulcrum chakra, the lower chakras and the upper chakras. And, it, and it's almost like the more you learn, the more you realize we're all sort of talking about the same stuff. So I think the question is like, not whether you believe in chakras or another system. It's like, do you believe in subtle energy? And if all these different systems are telling us that there are some key similarities here. Is that enough to be something you want to latch onto? And then the next thing I want to share about the chakras is simply that they are a tool, just like a map is a tool, right? Um, We use a map to try to get to point A to B, right? (laughs) Or, or Or to drive successfully from Sacramento to San Francisco, right? It's simply a tool. So if you resonate with the the Chinese system, that's great because that's a map that's working for you to access your subtle energy. But many people resonate with the chakra system. And and, and I like to think of the chakras, that system as a tool for folks, a gateway, because it's very hard to just say, okay, suddenly like become aware of your subtle energy. Why I love the chakras is because the chakras have these characteristics. They have colors, Mm -hmm. elements, glands that are associated, senses, doshas, yantras, visualizations that are associated with each, bija mantras that are associated with each. So no matter what kind of learner you are, you know, sort of like whatever is easiest for you to tap into, there's something there for you in the chakra system. That's why I love it. And I'm passionate about it. And and that's really uh, like what you're saying. The same exact thing could be conceived of in the wood element, the fire, the earth, the metal, the water, you know, which corresponds with an internal organ, a color, a sound, a season of the year, a taste, a, an area, a channel in the body, points along the body, you know, emotional and psychological. And so, yes, like it's it's a way of breaking down the the affiliation between the physical and the subtle. And so could you give us some concrete, give us a tour of the chakra system? It, it seems to me like the first, when I first remember, I, I think it was like Carolyn Mace, um, Anatomy of the Spirit, which we read in 
I actually read it in acupuncture school in like a personal growth kind of a counseling class uh, just so that you could become aware of your own issues and obviously not a primary source text at all, <laughs> but she like correlated it with... Um, Christian and and Jewish mysticism also like that there's overlaps in those traditions anyway all sorts of all sorts of groovy overlap but I remember thinking it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs you know like that starting yeah. starting with the mm-hmm. most basic of survival and then going on to like once you've got survival down you get to focus on things like relationship and your purpose and love and compassion and then you know the insight and creativity and spirituality you know like is it that simple that they go kind of from gross to subtle or from like from simple to um, to more ethereal? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you're totally on the right track and we can do a tour and I'll try to keep it brief yeah, <laughs> because yeah. there's a lot of them. And then, and then the next thing we can talk about is that I think a place where people get confused with the chakras is that there's the experience of each chakra. So for example, I have a really popular series on my site and on YouTube called the Chakra Challenge. And that's really designed for people who want to experience these energy centers, right? That's very different from something like my ritual series, which is for people who are already familiar with these energy centers and now want to start bringing them into balance each individually. And you might even work with a certain chakra, depending on your mood on a certain day. So you can also use them to shift your own internal energy. So I think it's important to to sort of like clarify those, those distinctions. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think people can, can get confused there or people can start to oversimplify. So the, the first thing I think we want to talk about before we do our tour is that all the chakras can either be in a state of what's called rajas, right? Like excess <laughs> or deficiency, tamas, de- depletion, basically. So let's just use the example of the throat chakra to make it super practical. We all know that person who talks a mile a minute, right? And they're like super, super, uh, you know, you can't get a word in edgewise because they're talking so much. They dominate the room. They are not good at listening And sometimes why I love the chakras too is because everything integrates to the physical practice. That person might kind of have their chin stuck way out, right? Like I visualize like olive oil from Popeye. Remember that show? Mm -hmm. Um, So there's actually also an imbalance in in the area of their fifth chakra and their cervical curve. That would be a rajastic excessive. Their throat chakra is in a state of excess, right? And then we all know that person who is terrified to speak up for themselves. Maybe they have that sort of hunched over rounded posture, chin dipped into the chest. Not always is the physical so perfectly mirror what's going on in the subtle body. I'm just trying to give listeners examples, right? And and they're afraid to say what they want and their throat chakra is completely shut down. And so that their throat chakra is in a state of deficiency. So what we're looking for in each chakra is to come into a state of sattva guna, balance, right? Where there, there's, there's the right amount <laughs> of sort of active and, and, and passive energy. So you're a good speaker and you're a good listener, right? And, and you say the appropriate things at the appropriate times, but you're, so you, you speak up for yourself, but you're not overpowering. So when we talk about each of these energy centers, I think that's something that often also people oversimplify and that gets missed because this this is complex stuff. (laughs) Well, and it it also seems to me that, that, that having a balanced throat chakra would be predicated on having a balanced maybe second or third chakra of, you know, like that you have to be grounded in yourself. You have to feel confident in your ability to express yourself in order to actually do that, right? You know, so you have to be, have some sense of, of, of who you are and what you're about in order to be able, before you can express it. Totally. And that's where it comes back to working, you know, from the ground up or that hierarchy of needs. Although you don't always need to necessarily work with the chakras in a certain order, but we'll, we'll go more into that in a moment. So let's start with the root chakra, which is called Muladhara. And this is your foundation right? Your sense of safety, survival, your connection with the earth. So the element here is the earth. The color is red and the yantra is a golden square. People want to (laughs) visualize. Uh, This has to do with trust, boundaries, just feeling safe. And the chakras are also 
can be mapped to development, you know, it stages of life. So this is very much those early, early years, right? Where if you don't have water or food <laughs> or on a larger level, if you just don't feel safe. I mean, maybe you live in a palace, but you, you, you don't feel safe where you're at. You don't feel grounded. You don't have a a trust, a foundation. That's going to be a a huge problem. So those are all issues that correlate with the Ren or the conception vessel in Chinese medicine that, that, um, bonding boundaries, one-on-one relationships, safety, home, comfort, that those kinds of things that are that that happen early on that take their template from the very early parts of life and and that things where survival is is an issue and and, and sure enough the ren or the conception vessel originates at the very base of the torso perfect i love it we can like compare notes as we go <laughs> we can indeed and- and, and, and yes, and that pelvic, uh, sorry, the, this root chakra is said to be at the pelvic floor. Yep. Although some traditions say it actually extends below into the ground beneath you, which I think is so nice. cool. And I have some meditations and visualizations around that. And in Chinese medicine, the Ren and the Du and the Chong all originate from the lower Dantian in the place that we would think of as the uterus, but then descends to the pelvic floor before the Ren comes up the front and the Du comes up the back of the body. Mm, nice. Okay, so moving on up, we have Svadhisthana, which is the second chakra. So the element here is water. The color is orange. And this is, it's it's hard, but it's like between your pelvic floor and your navel. So very much uh, associated with, yes, the the womb, (laughs) Um, desire, creativity, emotion, sexuality, all of these things reside in these elements of, of the second chakra. So very much where our creative impulse uh, impulses come from, like that unique creative spark that we all have, sexuality for sure, uh, desire. So these are all elements that are associated with this place. The yantra is a silver crescent moon in, in a U shape, if people want to want to visualize that. And it's associated with the adrenals, um, but but very much about sort of um, tumult and, and and change. I always visualize like the tumultuous waters of the second chakra. Yeah, so that's the second chakra, and then the third is Manipura, which is your solar plexus, your center. So I think of it, you know, just a, a little bit above your your navel. The color there is yellow. The element is fire, right? So we had earth, water, now fire. And the the third chakra is really about our willpower and our self-esteem. So do we stand up for ourselves? Do we have a healthy sense of, of self-esteem? These are all questions um, associated with the third chakra, as well as our work, right? Um, energy, right? If someone's like has no energy, that's probably like a third chakra imbalance or a problem. If someone's crazy type A, that would be an excessive third chakra. So, and if you feel like you're a victim all the time, right, that would be a deficient third chakra. So that's a really key one. And then as we move on up, We get to Anahata, the fourth chakra, which is green in in color. The element is air, which is easy to remember because it's in the area of our lungs. And the here, Anahata is super interesting because it's what I call the fulcrum chakra because you have three below and three above. So it's not really part of the lower chakras or the upper chakras. It's that fulcrum. And obviously, this is about compassion, service, love, uh, love for ourselves, and love for others. Um, so, so far, it sounds like the heart chakra, Anahata, has so much overlap with the heart organ system in Chinese medicine, but also compassion we associate with the spleen, interestingly enough. Um, and then the lower two, that second and third, there's thing, there's components of both liver and kidney that you described that I, I think of for both the second and third, that things that have to do more with like desire and sexuality and uh, that and, and emotion are going to have more to do with liver and pericardium to some degree, which is compared with liver. And then the self-esteem and uh, willpower are, are very much about kidneys. 
in general. So that's going to be more, more third. Mm. So now, yeah. So here we are back up in the heart and where things are pretty abundantly clear that, well, and in Chinese medicine, we ascribe the heart as the center, the integrator of the mental and emotional functions. So the center of the chest is is massive in terms of being able to be present because you've cleared the emotions of the past, essentially. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. For for us in the chakra system, it's very much, you know, the the lower chakras and the upper chakras all meet in this fulcrum of the heart. Mm. And the yantra here, the visualization is a blue six pointed star with, which if people are familiar with like the star of David, you know, those yeah. two triangles, which I, I just love because it really sort of epitomizes that, that energy center. The lower two and the upper two yes, ch- exactly. chakras, Coming like together. that's yes. it's a really, really cool way of envisioning that star. Yeah. The Basics of Chinese Medicine, Your Inner Ecosystem is an eight week learn from anywhere course that will demystify acupuncture and Chinese medicine. By the end of the course, you'll be able to begin to align your lifestyle and diet with daily and seasonal rhythms so you can digest better, have more energy, and stay healthy, and determine which systems in your body tend to be out of balance and how you might tend to them with lifestyle, diet, acupressure, and more. Each week, you'll get 20 to 30 minutes of an audio lecture so you can listen in your car, at the gym, while you're washing dishes, or wherever. Fun quizlets, reflection questions, and exercises to reinforce the material you're learning. Plus, you'll get three 60-minute group phone calls with Brody so you can ask questions, discuss new concepts with classmates, and learn in a group setting. Go to BrodyWelch.com and click on Basics of Chinese Medicine under the Learn From Home tab to find out more. Classes start October 18th, so reserve your spot today. Moving up, we have the Visuddha, which is the throat chakra. So Anahata, our element was air. With Visuddha, the element is space. The color is blue. And we used that as an example earlier, but obviously throat chakra. This is the realm of sound, communication, listening, finding your voice, wisdom, all of these things. The the organ is the vocal cords. And the yantra here for visualization is a smoky gray egg in a white circle. And then going up, we have what I think is sort of the most famous, the most famous chakra, the one that has the best PR person, Ajna, right? The third eye chakra. So I think a lot of your listeners might be familiar with that one. (laughs) And it lives right between just above your eyebrows. And this is said to be the seat of really our, our intuition. Um, the, it's the element is, it's like, it's the command center of the elements. There's not one specific element assigned here. It governs self-realization, our power to visualize the future, have insight, have wisdom is all in this place. And the yantra is a violet oval with beams, with five beams of light coming out of it. So when I think third eye, I just think intuition. <laughs> That's like the easiest. In the Qigong tradition, if you go down from the crown of the head and in from the space between the brows, you get to this particular point that is said to be the seat of insight, really. And it, it's very much everything that you just said, Chinese medicine, it's totally in the Chinese medicine tradition too, especially in Qigong. And the acupoint that is right there between the brows is known as yin tang, which is the hall of impression to, again, we associate with intuition, um, with insight and, and with bringing it together. I would also consider it it's something that can help us shift our perspective and back down to throat chakra for a second. Um, it, that's going to, that's going to be associated with the lungs in Chinese medicine that, cause the lungs govern the vocal cords and, and speaking, but also heart because heart is self-expression. And just to yeah. put this into a practical example for folks as we go, We talked about the chakras as these spinning wheels, these spinning vortexes, and how they're spinning is that there's a current of manifestation that's moving down Shashumna Nadi and what's called the current of liberation that's moving up from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. And that's what's making them all spin. So when you add on that additional (laughs) layer of complexity, but it's really not complicated, right? Because, and I like to pause and talk about this maybe here at the sixth chakra because, because if you, we all know that person, right? Just like we know the the person who won't shut up. We know people who have incredible vision, right? Like they 
are so incredibly talented. They can visualize amazing things. They have great ideas, but they can't put any of those ideas out into the world as action. Like the next action steps, you know, which are like discipline and willpower, third chakra, right? Or, you know, connecting with other team members or teammates, that relational aspect of maybe fourth chakra. They're kind of like stuck in the upper chakras, if that makes sense. And so their current of liberation is, is super strong, meaning that they're really connected and again, inspiring and have these great ideas, but they really struggle with that current of manifestation, like bringing their ideas into fruition. It's like that Thoreau quote, you can build your castles in the sand, in the sand but now build your foundations underneath them or build the, stair- the staircase. Right, exactly. And then you might have someone who has a very... Uh, strong, you know, current of manifestation, right? Like they're, they're just plugging along and, you know, a hard worker, but they don't have any connection to a higher power. They don't have this insight, this wisdom, or they don't have a vision for their life, right? So this is where you can start to kind of maybe see and play that um, just bringing these themes into the chakra system as a whole, instead of just looking at them one by one. And uh, I'll finish with the the last chakra, or the last major one of the seven is Sahasrara, the crown chakra. And this is said to be at the crown of the head or sometimes even displayed above the head, kind of like a halo. And this is beyond all the elements. This is enlightenment, our connection to source, God, Brahma, universal intelligence, whatever you want to call it. And the yantra here is the a thousand petaled lotus. And the bija mantra is, is om, right? That, that eternal sound of om. So definitely the most esoteric of, of the chakras. There's no real cor- yeah. place that it corresponds to the physical body exactly. And that's a place that we call Bai Hui or hundred meetings in, in Chinese medicine. That's the acupoint that's at the top of the head. And it's a hundred meetings because the channels do meet there. The idea being that we transcend the, the body and that we open up to the heavens. We open up to the inspiration of all that is. And so in Qigong, like we often do this gathering motion. We gather the energy from from the sky, from from the ethers, and we pull it down and we beam it into the crown chakra and we beam it down Sushumna Nadi. And that literally is how we how we bring in yang energy into the body, which is kind of a corresponds to that ethereal stuff that you were just talking about. So 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 cool. I love all the overlap. Makes me happy. Yeah, makes me happy too. <laughs> So in terms of people working with these energy centers, I know we're, we're just about out of time here, but if you could give people, if any of these issues stands out and someone's like, wow, that's totally me, how could they begin to work with a chakra, so to speak, or quote unquote, balance a chakra? Great question. So the first step, I think, is to get an experience of each energy center individually. So you could do that a million different ways. I mean, there's billions of guided meditations. There's there's my classes, the chakra challenge that I mentioned. There's so many ways. Just get, get familiar with each of the chakras. Once you're familiar with each, the next question is, well, is is mine, you know, for each for each one I mentioned, is it in a state of excess or deficiency? Or a lot of times it might not be that clear. You just sort of use the chakras as themes of of things you want to work on, for example, right? Like if you have a huge problem standing up to yourself or or standing up for yourself, whether it's speaking your true thoughts and your mind to your partner or your boss, you might be like, hmm, third chakra, like self-confidence, self-esteem is probably interesting for me, as might be throat chakra, right? So you could kind of hone in on two of them. And then what starts to get more nuanced is like the type of practice you do to balance uh, an excessive throat chakra as compared to a deficient throat chakra is slightly different, right? Which so, makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Which makes sense. So, you know, keep in mind in chakra challenge, I'm keeping it simple, right? It's just like, we're just experiencing the energy centers to get people familiar with them. And then the, the next level would be to, to do that, that kind of deeper work where you're doing maybe different types of yoga asana or different visualizations in your meditation to balance each of these centers. So that's what I suggest people do. I, I suggest they get familiar to try to get a sense of which chakras are in excess or in deficiency or just have thematic qualities that really like resonate with them. And then to maybe pick two to work with for 
a period of, of a month or so. And why I love my ritual series, which people can also get, I think they're the first couple of classes are, are free, um, is because we do the journaling work and affirmation work associated with each chakra. Um, and then you can really start, you know, having fun with it and, and using it to, for example, if I feel super, super tired, I'm like, hmm, maybe I should power up with some fire and do a third chakra oriented class, right? And in that sense, it's not even about so much like that specific chakra within my body. It's more like the qualities of that energy can be used to balance my day in the moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. And and, it, and a lot of what you're saying is, is these basic truths, right? Like we treat with opposites. First, we get familiar with what system is the problem in, you know, or like, where do I need to pay attention internally? As I'm sure you've taken plenty of anatomy as part of yoga teacher training and things like that. When you understand, when you can visualize the muscle that you're that you're stretching or like the area of the body that you're trying to open, when you have a visual on it, when you can see it in your mind's eye, the more you understand about a given area, the more you can work with it in a subtle way, the more you can move the prana through that area. I feel like understanding the energy anatomy in the same way, like you're giving us this framework for that we can just begin to see ourselves in a new way, visualize our bodies in a new way instead of, you know, the, sort of from the physical level but to be able to have a different experience of ourselves. And then maybe if we are at that kind of, if this is kind of not a new concept, so something that we've been working with for a while, then might be able to take the next step and, and maybe self-diagnose excess or deficiency an interplay, like where it seems like for if somebody's not grounded enough, it could be that there's a deficiency lower down or an excess higher up, or maybe the bridge between them is broken, you know, like, or just... Right. Like it, if someone so, wants yes. to strip it back to like the most basic level, if you're like, whoa, I think my mm-hmm. current, of manif- current of manifestation is super strong. Like I want more inspiration, more wisdom, more connection with divine source, right? Like, and, and to sort of like open my heart and get into those upper chakras, like back bends are going to be awesome. Focusing on a meditation practice is going to be great to get you more connected to the upper chakras. If you're someone who's like, I have all these great ideas, but I can't accomplish a thing, right? That's where you might want to do more forward folds in your practice, mm-hmm. right? You might want to like maybe meditate a little less or do some more grounding breath work as opposed to something like Kabbalah Bhati, which is like, you know, channeling energy up. So all of a sudden it just without even like going crazy deep into the a specific chakra just being aware uh, that the system exists and that again the reason i love it and i'm passionate about it is because it just it gives you so many tools like each chakra is like a little gem that has colors visualizations like affirmations all these things attached to it so it's like wherever you can hook on to or if you just kind of hook on to this idea of upper lower or current of manifestation liberation that's great just have the system meet you where you're at and just know that it's it's super deep and rich and there for you. <laughs> I love that you have given us such a wonderful little mini class at, at exposing us to the potential that the system has to offer. And so if people want to work with you or go deeper into this stuff, where can they find you? So the best place to go is brettlarkin.com forward slash chakra. If you want to do the chakra challenge, which I think is a great gateway and brettlarkin.com forward slash ritual, which is just R-I-T-U-A-L is, is that combo practice I mentioned of uh, videos where I combine the yoga and the journaling and some chakra work too. So those would be two great links, uh, brettlarkin forward slash chakra and brettlarkin forward slash ritual for people to check out if they want to go deeper on the things we talked about specifically today. And of course, people can find me at my website, which is brettlarkin.com and on YouTube. If they just search my name, there's a huge community there. Well, thank you so much, Brett. I really appreciate all that you've been willing to share with us today. Wonderful. Well, I I love getting to compare systems with you. So let's let's do it again soon. (laughs) Sounds good. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You could also head to BrodyWelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.